I mentioned this morning that I would have a sermon this afternoon that deals more with mothers. I've never made it a habit, as I've said before, ever Mother's Day, to think that I had to preach at least one sermon on mothers. Not because I didn't believe in what the Bible said, the importance of marriage, the family, and fathers and mothers certainly are, but simply to not just always make it that way on that particular day. The day I choose to mention as I did this morning about the mother of Christ and try to make a point about that, but I want us to look this afternoon at, for lack of a better way to put it, what mothers deserve. But as I say that, I think of how things have changed since I was a child as far as marriage, and the home, and the role of father, the role of mother. How many people are just completely ignoring, don't care one way or the other, about the divine institution that is marriage? How many children by the literal thousands are born out of wedlock? You don't even hear anything called an illegitimate anything anymore. And that's sad. Nothing was ever meant to reflect upon the poor child who's born out of wedlock. It couldn't do anything about it. But the point is, God has a way of doing things. God has ordained certain things to be this way and he expects people to abide by it. And God ordained marriage and the home for the good of man. And yet, as I said, it's been abused and misused. And now you've got homosexual so-called marriages. You've got transvestites or whatever. Uh, you just have immorality and rebellion against God. That's all that is. People can make out of it whatever they will, but that's all it is. But then when it comes to a day like today that is Mother's Day, and it's a fine thing that we have such things, think of all those kids out there that don't know about a mother as the Bible teaches about a mother. And maybe it's two men. Maybe it's two women. Who knows? I don't know how they can stop now polygamy from coming back in vogue. How are you going to allow homosexual marriages and not allow for polygamy? I don't think that people will go for that quite so much. There's just too much money involved. And money tends to, <laughs> money tends to call the shots on a lot of things. But you never know, it just anything goes. But I am glad we still have people who uphold God's laws of marriage and the home and the roles of mamas and daddies. I'm glad we still have a Mother's Day. You might wonder about this national holiday in the United States. It's on the second Sunday of May. How did that happen to be that we would set aside that? And each state decided to do that. It wasn't the whole federal government. You know, frequently it is celebrated, as I'm sure it has been today with you, by flowers and cards and presents and taking mama out to eat and, and this kind of thing. And, and that's, that's fine. That's great. And maybe they go home and visit. And Christians may go to worship with their mothers. But how did this holiday come about? More importantly, what do our mothers, as I said in the beginning, deserve from us? Of course, not just on Mother's Day, but every day. Well, let's look at just a little bit of history, though some of you, if not all of you, may know this. In 1907, two years after her own mother died, a woman by the name of Anna Jarvis of Philadelphia started a campaign to honor mothers. In 1910, the state of West Virginia became the first state to recognize, officially, Mother's Day for that state. Just one year later, nearly every state officially marked the day. So it started with the states, as I said earlier. But in 1914, it was President Woodrow Wilson who officially proclaimed Mother's Day a national holiday for the second Sunday of May. And that's how it came about. However, it's very interesting that uh, there was great concern by the founder or the one that crusaded for this day about the day's commercialization. And Anna Jarvis uh, 
her accomplishment soon, of course, uh, was commercialized, as anything like this usually is. And that became to her a very bitter disappointment. In fact, she became just very enraged at its commercialization, or what she called that. She even filed a lawsuit to stop a Mother's Day celebration in 1923. She was even arrested for disturbing the peace at a war mother's convention because they were selling white carnations, and that was her symbol for mothers, uh, to raise money. She didn't like that, even though it was going for a good cause. And her complaint was, I wanted it to be a day of sentiment, not profit. So you see, you, you have these things start. They start so long ago, you don't even realize these things transpired. And yet the idea is a good thing. It's a good thing. Now, when we were in Russia, they don't have a Mother's Day. They have a Woman's Day. And they have a Man's Day. And they celebrate it in a great way, but they don't have a Mother's Day. It'd be interesting to know of the thinking of the powers that be, or that were, <laughs> that established Woman's Day and not a Mother's Day, and a Man's Day and not a Father's Day. It may have something to do with communism and atheism and the idea that the state is higher than the, father, the home because that's exactly what they think when it comes to, that is communist, when it comes to children and, and the home. State is all important. This was even the view of Nazis. The state is all important. It comes before everything else. It may sound a bit familiar as to what is going on by some in this country today. What do mothers deserve? Well, they deserve obedience from their children. I know that because God said so. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1, it's also said in Colossians 3.20, but Paul wrote in Ephesians 3, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. There's something wrong with parents who do not teach their children to render obedience to them. There's something wrong with the atmosphere of a home where such does not take place. Parents should be what God says mom and daddy ought to be. That's true. But nevertheless, they still are to obey their parents. Now the little words there, in the Lord, has to do with things in harmony with the way God wants parents to operate in harmony with His will in the Lord. He's not saying now you have to be in the church or you don't have to do these things. Outside the church, you can just neglect them. That's not it at all. The law of God is for everybody, whether they acknowledge it or not, all men are amenable to it. The whole body of law that is the perfect law of liberty, the New Testament. So this is the way it ought to be in all homes. It ought to be uh, an, an attitude of respect and submission by children. Well, you know, you see, that's already gone by the wayside. i never forget some years ago, I was across over here and just getting into my car at a pharmacy. And I heard all this racket a good, I don't know, from here to the front of the building or a little further away. And it was a, I guess she was a parent, it was a woman. And she was trying to get kids in the car and this boy looked to be eight or 19 years old. And when I saw her, it was all screaming and yelling, he had, this woman, I'm supposing his mother, one handful of hair here, one handful of hair here, and he was giving her this as she tried to get it in the car. Well, you know, that just doesn't seem like to me he was very obedient, very respectful, and I didn't see her trying to cut his throat or anything like that or abduct him. She was just trying to get him in the car. So things have fallen on hard times, and they've been on these hard times for a long time, and the times are getting a lot harder. Solomon counseled his son, do not forsake the law of your mother. Proverbs 1.8, that presupposes a law. It presupposes a law that fits in with all that a home ought to be and the way children are to be brought up in the home. Even Jesus, as we noticed this morning, obeyed his mother as he was growing up. Luke 2 verse 51. And of course we're talking about the time that children are under the jurisdiction of their parents. So I ask the children here today, do you give your mother obedience 
Or do you have that disposition toward them? So mothers deserve obedience. But you know you're not going to get that unless first of all children have the respect of their parents that they ought to have. So mothers deserve respect. In Ephesians 6 and verse 2, Paul wrote, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Now that's an echo of the law of Moses in Exodus 20 and verse 12. Now what is it that you may live long on the earth? How does honoring your father and mother, how does obeying them cause you to live long on the earth? Well, I could be facetious and say if you disobey them, since they brought you into this world, they can send you out. And maybe in some cases, uh, according to the law of Moses, if the child cursed the parents, they're to be stoned to death. But at the same time, it tells us also that if parents are doing their part and they're concerned with kids and they understand their duty to rear those kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, then what it's actually saying is if you're taught properly and you abide by laws of the land and you're particular about your life, you're going to choose those ways that are not going to lead you out here to running down the middle of the freeway or something like this. The idea is you'll be raised in a proper way to think circumspectly and to examine things, not wade off into deep water to use a manner of speaking. Solomon warned of grave consequences for those, as I said earlier, who curse their parents, Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 20. And I was impressed and was a number of times going into the Far East at the respect and the honor that came from the Asiatics when it came to their parents. It's quite an amazing thing. It will get your attention very much as to how they do things. I remember when we worked with the Vietnamese after the fall of Vietnam back in the 70s, I visited with a young man who, member of the church, that's who we were trying to work with. We were trying to meet with those who were escaping Vietnam, who were members of the church, and that's another story. But I remember talking to him, and he was telling how that he was the oldest son. And that means a lot over there. You're, we joke sometimes about number one son, but that's real to them. Uh, he, because his father had died, just simply put off everything about going to school and all that went along with growing up and becoming an adult and stayed home to take care of his mother and to take the place of his father in rearing his younger siblings. That says a lot. I wonder about that and how it would go so well today. But a Chinese proverb says, respect for one's parents is the highest duty of civil life. And as you look back through the Old Testament, all the way through the Old Testament, it certainly was something that was highly upheld. I don't see that as a common thread running through our society anymore as it once was. I can remember folks my father's age, it didn't make any difference whether a person was five years older or 20 years older. I, Daddy was always yes sir and no sir, and yes ma'am and no ma'am if he spoke to somebody older than him. Common decency demands that we respect our parents, especially our mothers. So I ask, do we give our mothers the respect they deserve? Some of us have already lost our parents. And you know, it's, it's a good feeling to know that you did what you ought to do as a child. And that doesn't mean that you were the perfect child when you were growing up under those parents' jurisdiction. But it does mean that you did learn something as to what you ought to be while you were growing up. And when you became an adult... You understood it better, and there's a lot of things you'll remember after having become an adult that'll make more sense to you. When you become an adult, though they may not have made that much sense to you when you were a child, because that's what it means to become an adult. We need to understand that we owe them affection. Elisha demonstrated the affection properly due parents. When Elijah chose Elisha you may remember 1 Kings 19 Elijah threw his mantle on Elisha 
Elisha was, was plowing it that time. Kind of an interesting situation. We don't need to go into all that. But he came to him and threw the mantle on him. That was his sign that you're to take my place. I'm going to leave. God's going to call me away. And it's interesting to look in verse 20 of 1 Kings 19 because Elisha told Elijah, let me go kiss my mom and daddy first and I'll come on. I've always thought that was an interesting comment as to the affection he had. He knew he had a great work to do. Greater than probably at that time he even thought about it. But he knew where his affection needed to be displayed before he launched into that work. You know, there should be a lot of affection. I don't know that people understand affection. A lot of people, I think people get it mixed up with emotionalism sometimes, which is not necessarily proper biblical affection. But there ought to be a warmth between children and their parents, and especially between them and their mother. Uh, there's something wrong if children have the same viewpoint of their father as they do their mother. It shouldn't be that way. Now, not in the sense of respect and obedience and love, but after all, it's God's wisdom that said here is a man to be a man and a husband and a father, and here is a woman, a female, to be the mother, to be the wife. The feelings are different. It was supposed to be that way. It wasn't meant to be, wait, why not have two men? You know, God God could have brought people into this world all sorts of ways. Out under a cabbage leaf. Uh, maybe a stork. But he chose the way he did. And that's always interested me. It's the implications of why God chose that. So there is the impression a woman as a female makes upon a child. And there's an affection that that child has toward the female. And it's going to be different from the proper attitude and respect and affection a child had toward the mother. So we owe them obedience. We owe them respect. We owe them affection. We owe them to be wise in our choices. <laughs> to learn from what they've taught us. How they've trained us. And how they've educated us. And I fully recognize different people did much more in those areas than other people did as far as parents are concerned. But I know Proverbs 10 and verse 1 and it's echoed throughout Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 17, 25 brings up the idea too. Concerning wisdom, a foolish son is the grief of his mother. Well, a foolish son is somebody who just does not make wise decisions. Wisdom demands, as was talked about Wednesday night by Ken, and we discussed it some in the class, that uh, you fear God. That's the beginning of wisdom. Well, if you want to bring hurt to a mother, don't fear God. I mean, she taught you to. Taught you to be obedient, to fulfill your responsibility. Just don't fear Him. Then don't pay attention to God's will because you don't fear Him. Why should you respect His authority and His word in your life? Then go ahead and just live like you want to live and live a riotous life, rebe rebellion to God. So a foolish son is the grief of his mother. And we studied again last Wednesday how that Jesus increased in wisdom as he grew from childhood to adulthood, Luke 2.52. I don't suppose that anybody has this deep abiding concern for their children like a mother does. There's a song that was made popular years ago. I think old Willie Nelson may have made it. You're always on my mind. Well, that's exactly right when it comes to mothers and their children. I remember when our children were little and we stopped by the nursing home to see my grandmothers. We were going back up North Arkansas where I preach. And she had a roommate and being a nursing home, you know their ages, yet they could uh, get around pretty good. They just couldn't function like they had at one time. And as we went back out all four hours and they were just stair steps, she followed them out. I can see the old lady and I don't remember her name now. Uh, 
that was with my grandmother, but she followed us out and she was playing with the kids. And she looked up at both Jody and me. And I think I had one in my arms and one standing here and Jody had one and one here. Y'all just didn't know us at the right time of life. Uh, and she looked at them all there. And we were about to get in the car and she said, well, you think right now they're always going to be on your toes and you never will be without them, but someday they'll, they'll be on your heart. That's right. They always will be. So I'm saying to you, younger parents, you just got kids, kids, kids. You're always going to have them there. They're going to be always there. They're going to have you up at night and all that. Oh, turn around two or three times. And you'll wonder, what are they doing? Where are they? Oh, I hope she doesn't marry him. Oh, I hope she does marry him. <laughs> so on and so forth. Uh, take advantage of these few years that you have them under your jurisdiction and raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and enjoy them. Because I'm going to tell you a little secret. They're going to do just exactly like you did, and they're going to leave you and find somebody else. And marry them and start their own home. And you're going to try to, well, why would they want to do that? Because you did. And they're walking just like all humans walk, and as God said it ought to be when it comes to establishing a new home. Much wisdom can come from the advice of mothers themselves. Mothers need, of course, to learn some wisdom on how they give that advice out. Unless they want to be problems. And I don't think they do. So we, do we give our mothers the wisdom they deserve in our actions and listening and learning? Or do we bring them a great deal of hurt? Obedience, respect, affection, wisdom. But you know they also deserve righteousness in our lives. The righteous bring joy and gladness to their parents. Again, that's found in the book of Proverbs, chapter 23, verses 24 and 25. More important than any other achievement is that of a righteous character. I know we like to see our children well fixed economically and all that kind of stuff. That's all right, but it's always secondary. We ought to want to see our children more than anything else faithful to God in all that that means. Everything else work out all right if they're faithful to God as the New Testament teaches that. Nothing makes a mother happier, as I've already alluded to, and more pleased than to have a righteous son or a righteous daughter. Today, true righteousness comes through faithfully following Jesus Christ. It's always been that way. I need not say to this audience that's the case. But you can read about it in Romans 3, 21 and 22. To live a godly life. To choose things on the basis of the Bible. To make up one's mind. And even in choosing a wife or a husband. Let righteousness guide you in doing that. Find you somebody that can... That will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness with you. Then the last thing I want to mention is that they deserve our care. Now, may, Rachel may think that, well, mom and dad is getting older and he's using this opportunity to preach to me because uh, I expect her to take care of me. Well, I don't want her taking care of me in this sense any more than she wants to start too early <laughs> with me. <laughs> But the truth of the matter is, it's involved. Look how much the Bible has to say concerning parents, especially widowed mothers, how they deserve our care. 1 Timothy 5, verses 4 and 8 and 16. James 1, 27. Pure religion, undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the widows and orphans and their afflictions, to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Brother Ken and I were visiting this morning a little bit how that if we don't watch out, we can have the idea that we can just always turn to our bread in the church and they'll give us money when we can't get any. Well, it is an obligation the church help people who can't be 
uh, helped otherwise. But have you ever noticed how much is said in First Timothy? Uh, and I summed it up with him this morning by saying, what is being said about taking care of widows is this. When the families have done all they could do and they can't do any more and there's still help that needs to be done or there's no families there to help somebody, then the church steps in because it says, and not let the church be burdened. I have an obligation to my parents. You have an obligation to yours to show care for them when they cannot care for themselves any longer. Indeed, children are to be their parents' social security. What, what do you think happened in the country, say, a hundred years ago, before there was any such thing as social security? How, how were old folks taken care of? Well, granted, they, as a rule and in general, didn't live as long. You had an extended family, which we have virtually lost in this country. I can remember just when I was relatively small of older folks who, if they were alive today, be 140 years old. But at that time, they would be living with somebody. It was not unusual. And, and sometimes go back and look at the uh, census in the 1800s and even into the first part or first quarter of the 20th century. And look at the census, and you'll see the immediate family. Then a lot of times you'll have somebody else living there who could be a cousin who folks died. Or sometimes you'll have someone, an uncle, living with them, people taking care of them. Isn't it amazing that we should take care of our own when they can no longer provide for themselves? Why is that such a strange idea in our great day of welfare? Wouldn't you think that with all of the concern for welfare of people, that families would want to take care of their own? That's where it ought to begin. That's where God intended. That's God's way. That's God's pattern. And you know, it too is not going to change. It's not going to change on the day of judgment. God expects these things to be followed. So our parents deserve the best care we can afford to give them. Now, I recognize that some, according to health, may require professional medical care. But I don't think we should have the idea that, well, there's a nursing home. Uh, I don't want to fool with them. Let's just kick them out there as a matter of convenience. Nursing homes really were never considered for that reason. They served their purpose. I'd hate to know that with the way people can be health-wise in certain ages, that there's not a professional place so they can go. There's this things can happen to any one of us at a given age that would make it impossible for no matter how much our children want to help us to be able to, for them to provide that help. Until you go through some of that, <laughs> you just don't know what it's like. You can, do, you can do all you can sometimes do to a parent's health to try to help them. But due to the nature of the health problem, you cannot supply what they need. It seems to me love demands, since we're to take care of them, that we recognize when we cannot supply in and of ourselves what they actually need in order to be cared for, that we should seek then that professional care otherwise. If you've got a stroke patient that's 75, 80, 85 years old that cannot get around, is bedridden, you may have a lot of specialty things that you can't supply, that you can't handle because you're not trained to do it. It's good to have those. I, I, I'm not trying to embarrass her. She thinks I do all the time. but Well, not all the time, just most of the time. But the, the work that Rachel does and others like her when it comes to the people she works with, I couldn't do that. I don't have that kind of temperament, I guess. But all of the little ones she works with, their parents could not supply for them in most cases what they need no matter how much they wanted to because of the dire illnesses. Uh, some of them I'd never heard of since she told about them that she has to deal with and handle those little children. It's, uh, it's too much of a tearjerker to me in the shape those poor little ones are in that she tells about sometimes. Well, if your parents love them and you can't supply for them, but you love them and you have an obligation to them, aren't you going to use professional services? 
And so it would be the other way around, wouldn't it? When parents have needs and you're to care for them, God expects you to. It's part of your faithful service to God. Then you're going to seek the professional services you need to help them. I may say this in closing. We as parents, if we still have our brains about us when it comes to that kind of thing, and sometimes that's not going to be the case. But if we do, we ought to try to be cooperative with them. We ought to try to be cooperative with them. There comes a time in all our lives we don't just drop dead like that, that we're going to have to do some uh, changing of our plans and ways and freedoms. I know that... Uh, that Ken is looking forward to giving up his uh, driver's license because he can't drive anymore. Am I right, Ken? Yeah, I don't. You may. I know Nancy doesn't look forward to driving you around. <laughs> but the point is, if we make a joke about it, the thing about it is, those days come. And I hope, for me personally, I'm speaking for myself, having lived my best to be a Christian and prepare for the day of my death and if that's not what we're doing in being a faithful Christian I don't know what we're doing that it comes just like it hit my grandfather he was out mowing the yard went in to check his mower and all accounts was he was dead before he hit the floor from a heart attack and that's the way I'd like to go but we don't always get our druthers as the old saying goes and my mother had right the opposite situation yet I can remember her saying oh I hope I don't have to go through that but she did she went through years of it Years of it. It was terrible. We don't have, we just don't have those choices. Now, children, you have an obligation to perform. It needs to start like we said in all these different things that we're to do. It's going to come down to where all of us end our lives on this earth. And we have responsibility to one another. Your parents have a responsibility to rear you in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and get you up to be an adult, a responsible adult, a faithful adult. But then the time comes when things shift and you have to take care of your mom and daddy. Just the way it works. And by the way, when I was a lot younger than this, I preached the same sermon. <laughs> so it's not just pleading, have mercy on me. Not that at all. Now, do we understand these things are as significant about Christian living as anything else about Christian living? If we don't, we miss the apple. We've missed the orange. We've missed the boat that carries the apples and the oranges if we can't understand those things. Well, we talked about these things concerning godliness and what we owe our mothers, and we owe it to them every day. And pay it while they're still here. Someday they won't be. Someday they won't be. If you're a Christian, that's a marvelous thing. But if you're not, now's the time to become one. It's the only time you have to believe that Christ is Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Him. And be baptized for the remission of sins. Become a Christian. As a child of God, are you faithful? Are you faithful in all areas? Do you follow the whole counsel of God? If you have failed, then repent. Turn away from those things. Confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. And let us say we love the mothers of this congregation and godly mothers everywhere. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.